I'd like to welcome a very familiar guest onto the show. He's one of the most recurrent guests in GRE history. He is the Rich Dad real estate advisor, and he's written so many influential books, both inside and outside of the Rich Dad series, like the foundational tome, the ABCs of real estate investing. And, you know, I've been in this real estate world for quite a while now, and this guest really, he is one of the more giving guys in the entire industry. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, Rich Dad Real Estate Advisor, Ken McElroy. Keith, always great to be on the show. I love spreading the message. Yeah, well, you've been helping our followers with that for quite a long time. Time. So let's kind of start at the beginning here. We talk about housing and the climate that we're in today. You predicted a housing crash to take place this year. And I think people have different definitions of crash. Some people think that that means a, a price correction of as, as little as 10%. But how do you define a crash and kind of what are the, the causes of what's coming here, Ken? Well, obviously, when I obviously I'm a little off on the crash. So you know, and and uh, I've been getting some feedback on that, and well, well deserved. You know, I think you know when I first came out and predicted it, none of the stimulus money and the continual stimulus money, and you know, we're going to get into the inflation piece. I know you and I, I I did not foresee that you know we were going to turn the printing presses on and uh, you know bail everyone out and 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 send so much money to people. Uh, I'm not saying they didn't need it. But that was my, uh, I was basing it off of 2008. However, with that being said, they did say, you don't have to pay your rent. You don't have to pay your mortgage. And uh, those are true things. And that ended yesterday, as you know. So, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I guess the, the forbearance piece is going to be kind of staggered. And, and the, the eviction thing was overturned at the Supreme Court, which is awesome. But so now what the, the only difference between that and now is that now these people have to pay, so, you know, they have to actually pay their rent and they actually have to pay their mortgages. And um, so who knows what's going to happen with the balances. So I still do think, Keith, that we have, you know, millions of people that are that are uh, in, in bad financial situations around owed rent and obviously own mortgages. So uh, I think that's gonna make its way through the system. So I might be a year off, but I, I still think we're already seeing corrections in some markets. The pace of price bidding wars on homes has certainly slowed. And hey, you know, if you're right, but the timing's a little off, you can still be right because it's more difficult than ever to make predictions with the government getting involved in keeping everything afloat and not letting people die. And I think the short story is, they really don't want to see people kicked out of their homes, whether it's a home that they own with forbearance or a home that they rent with the eviction moratorium that annoyingly got extended over and over and over again. But it's been uh, since August 26th that the CDC eviction moratorium expired. But since then, we've kind of seen eviction numbers that have been flat or down, and that's kind of confounded some people. So do we think the pace of evictions is going to be a more diffuse condition, or do you think that there's still a, a big wave that, that's going to hit? What, what are your thoughts with respect to the expiration of the eviction moratorium? Can something key for real estate investors in our income stream? Yes. So, so you're right on all the dates. The, uh, the truth is, if uh, most of the professionally managed properties kind of had most of the, you know, the delinquent rents, the, you know, the people that couldn't pay, uh, well communicated to and figured out, you, you know, we, we, we were still buying during that time and we bought two properties and each property had anywhere from 200 to 300,000 in delinquent. So, you know, I, I, the, the numbers are, are real. And, and I think what happens, Keith, you know, it's people that owe, let's say eight, nine, 10,000, 20,000 in rent, they're not going to pay it. Like, you know, it's not right. like, and, and all they have to do is go find somewhere else to move and then fight uh, with their credit, you know, somehow, like, you know, if, if the, if the landlord turns them over to credit or whatever, and they go to collections or whatever it might be, but the, the bigger issue is more on the forbearance. So, so I don't really, I never said, and I still don't think that the eviction moratorium is going to create this massive disruption. You know, we had the same kind of stuff happen in 08, as you know, it was very different. But we had, you know, we had a lot of people lost a lot of savings. And, and, and um, so, so I think what's, what's tempering things is just like what happened in 08, even though it's different, 
is that the people that now have to pay their mortgage, and, uh, as you know, we're starting to see listings go up. And as supply goes up, then prices, you know, the price wars go down and even potentially negative. And it's going to be interesting to how far that goes. But a lot of those people are going to sell their homes, scoop the equity, pay off the debt. Hopefully they can. And then they, you know, they're probably not going to re-enter into the housing market. They're probably going to re-enter into the rental housing market. We talk about tenants and the health of our tenant. That's clearly really important. And now that things are developing with the eviction moratorium expiring, at least the CDCs on the national level, we're trying to find out what happens with those tenancies. Now, some eviction filings have gone up from their pre-pandemic levels, like what's happening in Gainesville, Florida. But in many parts of the nation, these eviction filings are the same, or they've even gone down since the expiration of the moratorium. And economists and industry experts, people like me, myself, are trying to figure out why that is. And I think, you know, we need to remember that courts handle cases differently across the country and some courts might be backlogged so that would make for a more diffuse condition of these evictions taking place and we need to remember of course and you're aware of this can some nations uh, rather some areas of the nation still have protections in place annoyingly like new york whose eviction protections run into january 15th of next year and also some tenants might have just moved out on their own in order to avoid eviction and unfortunately there are some tenants that aren't even aware of their rights and they will just move out if a notice is posted on a door and they aren't even aware that, you know, something like a, a court case needs to take place to get evicted. Um, I think a few tenants, but yeah, it's clearly in the minority of tenants like we've discussed, Ken, a few tenants that might be a few months late, well, maybe they will pay to stay in the place that they're in because they got, you know, unemployment compensation dollars while they were staying at home. And I think another thing to keep in mind is the way that some judges have interpreted the CDC eviction moratorium. They didn't like it very much like we didn't like it. So I know that in states like Ohio, in Texas, in Tennessee, judges kind of barely enforced that eviction moratorium or ignored it even while it remained in place. We still got government aid that might be uh, reaching some people that hasn't been distributed yet. So do you have any more thoughts with regard to what might happen with the expiry of the eviction moratorium? I'm giving a lot of reasons for why this might get stretched out for quite a while. Yeah, well, um, all those points are valid. You know, you got to, every single person is different, right? So if, if you owe a year of rent and you're following the eviction moratorium, you're just going to move. So, you know, the filings are for the people that refuse to move that still owe. So, you know, a lot of people, I think, you know, when they come to that end, they're going to, okay, you know, and they're going to owe and they're going to move out owing. But I, you know, the next step is obviously evictions, which, and you're correct in all those cases, a lot, uh, a lot of landlords and a lot of judges and, you know, things are moving along still, but, but um, there's this big pent up number that haven't been. And, and my, I'll tell you, because, you know, I've, I've been through this before. It's, it's not going to be a train wreck. You know, people are going to move. Uh, and the ones that aren't going to move are going to have to, depending on the state laws. You know, in Arizona, you can literally get somebody out within 30 days. So now I know every state's a little bit different, but the you know from you, you don't need a judge to file. And, and you don't need a uh, you don't need a judge to to start the process and post on the door and all those kinds of stuff, all those kinds of things. So so once those things start, you, you know it it's just like um, you, you know, most people aren't going to go down with the ship, right? Like they're going to, they're going to, they're going to say, Hey, I'm going to bail now. Like I, I, I'm not protected anymore under the CDC moratorium. So I don't think that you're going to, you're that for sure. You're going to, the courts are going <laughs> to get backlogged. There's no question about that, yeah. but I don't think it's going to be as big as everybody thinks that it is and what the media has been saying, I, you know, and, and it's not going to be massively disruptive in, in, in I don't think either who's going to win are going to be the collection companies. You're right about that. So I think we're concluding that, yes, this will cause some pain, but I don't think there's going to be a sharp spike in evictions myself anyway. It is a factor, but it will be a more diffuse condition for some of these reasons that I mentioned. 
Um, and, you know, this really underscores, Ken, the importance of investing in landlord friendly markets. You mentioned Arizona, where it might take 30 days to evict a non paying tenant. That's fairly landlord friendly. I mentioned the way the judges have been interpreting the CDC moratorium in places like Ohio. Tennessee, Texas, three more generally investor-friendly states where you can get prompt evictions under normal circumstances. And, you know, you bring up something really interesting, Ken, with us coming off this eviction ban. You talked about you getting under contract on two buildings and there being a number of delinquent tenants. So I think my thought then, Ken, is how does an underwriter in borrowing, how do they interpret that when you've had delinquent tenants and they haven't been paying the rent and yet you're trying to get under contract for a building and trying to demonstrate an adequate debt coverage ratio, for example, yet you have some of these delinquencies? There's a couple things. One, if you back up even more, actually, we, we're, we're, uh, we, we closed on two and we have a third in escrow. So let's see, 648 units for the two and another 455 units. Congrats. Uh, in, in Austin, yeah, that we have an escrow. Um, and all of them have, you know, north of 200, you know, in the, in the, in the low 300s in, in, in um, delinquents. Now, so when I'm underwriting it, obviously the, you know, the, the seller is the one that's actually jeopardized. So we're underwriting it not as if they've been collected. We've underwriting it as if they haven't been collected. So, you, you know, so, you know, it's not that I'm taking on that risk. I'm the, the seller is actually taking on that risk by having a lower NOI. And so that lower NOI that, that I underwrite to is the same one that the lender underwrites to. So that's why, interestingly enough, if you can find buildings that are high and delinquent and you and you can buy it for how the property is operating today, it actually benefits the buyer. Sure. It's a benefit to have it appear that delinquencies are just no income. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. I mean, that think about no eviction moratorium. Isn't that the perfect property to buy? <laughs> like, you know, if uh, two years ago before all of this nonsense, you know, like, like I would always look for properties that were mismanaged, high delinquencies, high turnover, high vacancies, you know, a lot of uh, maintenance you know, needed. So the government just created this one. <laughs> sometimes it's sometimes it's the actual landlord. So, you, you know, those those broken projects are the best assets to purchase. And so for us, we were excited because we know that at some point the moratorium is going to end, whether the people pay or not, you know, is actually actually just a it's a check the box issue, you know, great if they do great if they don't, but there's no way that I would say less than 10% are going to pay they will probably, you know, at least 90% are going to, are going to move. And, um, you know, there's no way a tenant, if a tenant has 20 or $30,000, they're not paying the landlord. <laughs> they're yeah, they're short that much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they have, you know, if they're behind a month, you know, they're, they're going to, they're probably going to figure it out. But, but um, you know, we're, I'm talking about stuff that, you know, is, is well over a year. So I, um, you, you know, so we actually account for that before we even uh, make an offer. So, so it's really the seller of the property's issue. That's right. Because a savvy buyer, they want to see some meat on the bone. They want to see some opportunity into what they're buying into. And if you can close that delinquency gap, that's effectively arbitrage, that's profitability. Yep. And the time to close the delinquency gap is after the eviction moratorium has <laughs> yeah. expired. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, how can the seller argue that, you know, you know that uh, I, I'm like, well, they owe. Like, you know, how can you, how can you underwrite a property um, and, and showing it, you've got an occupied unit that's not paying, period. It doesn't matter, like, you know, at what stage? So, so you know, it it gets accounted for in less uh, of uh, less income and less net operating income. So, it's there. You know, there are great opportunities to buy these properties if you can hold on. You know, and and of course we we have we bought during and before we knew what was going to happen on at the end of the moratorium. 
evictions are a bad thing. I don't want to understate that. It's not convenient for the landlord. It often ravages families. But I've actually got a bright spot in evictions when you can actually get one today. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Rich Dad Real Estate Advisor Ken McElroy. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Americans are not saving for retirement. It's going to get worse as people live longer, so you need to think differently, but you can't lose your time. Real estate is the investment vehicle that has created more million and billionaires than anything else. Get Rich Education is one of America's top investing shows disrupting Wall Street. Your host, Keith Weinhold, is a true financial educator and has been an income property investor since 2002. Get Rich Education has created millions in passive monthly income for its followers. Now, Keith is a free course. Real estate pays five ways. Sign up now at getricheducation.com forward slash course. Invest in what produces income for you now and later. Use the link in the description to take the course for free. Real estate pays five ways. Get Rich Education is on every podcasting platform and has its own native iOS and Android apps. Join Get Rich Education Nation to create financial freedom through real estate investing. Subscribe wherever you listen. Average Joe invested in real estate and became a boss. Ever compared investments and wondered, what makes real estate special? Inflation will be your new best friend and you'll be increasing income while decreasing taxes because debt-free is dumb. Compound interest is lame. The US dollar is fake and real estate is real. Real estate simultaneously pays five ways. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. You're listening to a show that's created more financial freedom for busy people just like you than nearly any show in the world. We've got a repeat returning excellent guest, Ken McElroy. He's a rich dad real estate advisor. Ken, we're talking about evictions before the break. Okay, that's generally something that we don't want to have happen. But you know what's interesting, Ken? When a longtime real estate investor realizes that, you know, it's actually difficult to get steep rent increases on incumbent existing tenants that have lived in a property for a few years, but now when we do have a turn, whether that's an eviction or for some other reason, today we might be able to get a rent 10%, 15%, or even 20% higher because we've seen such substantial rent inflation. So I'm trying to find a silver lining in the eviction cloud here. That gives us an opportunity to turn the unit and really get substantially more income than we ever could, maybe even greater than the rate of inflation at this point. So just tell us some more about your thoughts about rent inflation and how much of it that you're seeing because you control thousands of units across the nation. Yeah, well, thanks, Keith. So, yeah, obviously, you know, just to t just to finish up on this eviction thing. Obviously, you know, my company we we have about ten thousand tenants. We rarely evict people. You know, like the like we didn't really have a big issue our company because of the the tenant that we put in there. That's the way things are supposed to work. Like when you buy a car, you're supposed to pay for it. Like when you rent an apartment, you're supposed to pay for it. And if you let people in that can't, um, you know, then you work with them. And so the ones that worked with us, Keith, we would never evict. So we have people that are making payments and all that kind of stuff. I'm only talking about the people that are, don't communicate, that literally you know, are trying to work with anybody. So, um, you know, so I just wanted to finish with that point because the last thing we want to do is displace people the, and, and people's lives have been disrupted and it's, it's to our benefit to sit down and work with them uh, and, and meet them where they are. So I just wanted to, you know, say that before I jump into the next piece on the rent inflation. Yeah, that says a lot about your screening up front and getting the right tenant in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So, so also to your point, you know, the reason why we were buying during the pandemic was multiple reasons. One, I really believe that there's going to be some disruption in single family housing with affordability and forbearance. That's number one. So you, we, you know, you can go on blacknight.com and you can see that there's millions and millions of people behind on their mortgages. So that's going to make its way through the system. Probably the majority of them are going to move into rentals. And that is going to put pressure on rentals. That's number one. Number two, we were already undersupplied for housing. So 
you know, if you go back and look at the multiple studies that there are about housing, you know, we've literally been undersupplied for the last 10 years. And there's a lot of reasons yeah. for that. You know, not just not just the cost to, to build them. You know, there's the land costs have gone up. The cost to build them have gone up. You, you know, the city requirements and density and zoning and, you know, all those things are, have become more difficult. So less housing has happened. So that's created a supply issue. The other thing is, if you think about it, nobody's raising rents during a pandemic. So, so literally the apartment, the apartment industry and the rental housing industry, you know, had a rough go, right? They, one, they were say, they said, you know, tenants don't have to pay you. Uh, and, um, and, you know, obviously they're not raising rents on folks during that time. So, so we've had a year, year and a half of pretty flat rent growth, obviously. And so, so you have all those factors happening at the same time. So, so, so now you have, you know, going on a year and a half to two years of delayed rent growth based on new demand and short supply. So, so now I, you know, I did a, a video on YouTube that I really believe that we're going to, you know, this, these next few years are going to be real, real tough for tenants. It's not going to be good. Actually, a landlord does not want to have to have a market that's so out of balance it, it really doesn't. It's not. It's not good for anybody. But what what we're already seeing is three, four, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, even a thousand dollars a month in rent increases. Now, I know those are big numbers, but it's true. Like I I know for a fact it's true. You, just in Scottsdale here, we're seeing seven hundred to a thousand dollars a month. You know, so somebody's let's say something was renting for a thousand or twelve hundred. You know, it's it's close to two thousand now, and and you know, so those are as they turn. So, so you know, the 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 the, the cat's not out of the bag yet on this. You know, on where all that's going to be. But the point is to you know, I guess the question you had initially was about rent inflation. I don't think it's as driven as much as all the money printing as much as the supply and demand issue. And then, and then, you, then you tack on the last piece, which are these crazy unique migration patterns based on you know, what's happening, the policies of these individual states. You know, never, never before have I been so interested with who our governors are, you know? <laughs> right. and, and, you know, like they've never been as important, you know, and they are important. So people are voting with their feet they're voting with their pocketbook and they're moving to places that they think are going to be stable, safe, and, and, uh, and aren't going to get uh, hammered on the, on the tax side. And so, you know, we already know this is happening. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, Texas, uh, Arizona, Florida, as an example, North Carolina. Uh, and, and so, you know, and Idaho. And so those are, those are happening. You, you know, there, it's not a, an opinion, it's like it is a fact. And so that's creating, again, more supply, more, um, I'm sorry, more demand in those markets with the existing supply and, and it's driving rents up. And so the prediction, which is ridiculous, is that Phoenix alone is gonna lead the country with 18% rent growth. Now, I have never seen, I was in Austin in the early days, you know, we were getting eight, nine percent a year. And we were like, holy cow, like this is crazy. And, and you know, this is double that. So it's going to be interesting to see if it really happens. But there are lots of markets that are projected, mostly in those states I mentioned, that are going to see some some very significant rent growth. It's not going to be good because all of a sudden it it hampers the affordability in that market. It hampers, you know, um, the traction by employers and all the things that people have when, you know, when things are in balance. So a better, a better housing policy is that equal supply. In my opinion, there needs to be about six months of supply of single family housing at all times on the MLS. That's been proven year over year over year. And that keeps things kind of in check on a slow appreciation. That's not, that has not happened. And the same thing with rent. So, you know, so what we have is this 
potential real problem that's going to uh, show up later. And, and the states, some of the states are going to adopt pretty aggressive rent control and, and um, you know, things like that from an affordability site or the government's going to throw money at people. So you, you mark my words, it's going to happen in the next two years. So many great takeaways there, Ken. Yes, in the health crisis, we really found out the true colors of a lot of state governors as they were often front and center in the national media. So, you know, people really, like you said, get to vote with their feet. And yeah, I think you make an interesting point with this rent inflation pickup. I think part of what is leading to that rent inflation, and you touched on it, is that in the years 2018, 2019, and 2020, rent growth was really tepid, really slow, and now it seems to be catching up all at once. And of course, all of this is demand driven. Depending on your source, we're about 5 million housing units short, and there are only about 130 million homes in the United States. So that's about a 4% shortage right there. People just need a place to live, whether it's a place to rent or a place to own. And that low supply helps drive that demand comparatively. Well, Ken, you've just been a lot of great takeaways here. You've got that big picture view because you do own so many units yourself. You don't have to go read studies from somewhere else and you can really look at your own numbers deeply and give our listeners insights that way. If someone wants to learn more about you, I think a lot of our followers already know, but you ought to remind them how they can do that because you've been giving out the value for decades. So tell us how one can learn yeah. more about you, Ken. Thank you. So yeah, I, I, the best spot is to go to KenMacro.com and you know, all the resources are there. We've got a great podcast. We've, we've got a really, really good growing YouTube channel and we're, I'm really, really focusing on trying to bring in amazing guests to, to help people uh, create wealth uh, for the long term. Um, and of course, I've, I've got all the books and stuff that I that I wrote. Uh, all that money goes to charity. I have a full time philanthropy director actually just giving away money all year. Literally, she's on our payroll. Um, and so it's really, really fun for me to, you know, own all these properties. We, we, we now have, uh, gosh, over a billion dollars worth of assets. My, my partner and I, Ross, and and um, it's a blast. I mean, we're building four or five projects. We, you know, we're 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 we're, we're going to be growing at say fifteen hundred to two thousand units of acquisitions a year, and um, it's a great time to be in this business. Even now, you know, everybody's kind of waiting for the top, right? Well, the rent market is about ready to take off, and and I talk a lot about that on KimMacRoy.com. Well, Ken, you're always expanding your means. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. My pleasure, Keith. Always good seeing you.